We're getting ready for Sunday morning worship here at Stephen Green Baptist Church. And I am very glad that you have joined us. I hope you will stay with us. And I hope that God will speak to you as you worship with us. Today in the message, we're going to be looking at an Old Testament character, a man named Caleb. And Caleb is known for one thing, but we're going to see that his story teaches us a lot that can challenge and help each of us to be better people each day that we live with the Lord. Uh, for example, from Caleb's own story, he gives us a challenge to be, like him, more committed, more confident in God's ability, and more courageous in living our faith. Caleb, even in his later years, as an old man, still demonstrated those qualities that serve as an example for all of us. And so again, thank you for joining us, and I hope that God will speak to you. You'll be drawn closer to Him, and your faith may grow. And let's go now into the worship time together. Our Father, again today, we do thank you for your love that changes our lives when we put our faith in you. We thank you for the hope and inspiration that we get from knowing Christ as Savior. But we thank you too, as we have been just reminded, for the love that we share as your family of faith and as a church family. And again today, I thank you for our time together. I thank you, Father, that you use us in your ministry together. And we need each other because we share this ministry. Thank you so much for binding us together in the love of Jesus Christ. Now bless us as we wait before you in worship. May we hear your spirit speaking not only with our ears but with our hearts. And we will thank you for what you do in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Hymn number 286 reminds us of the person we are here to worship and whose name we are here to lift up. There is a Savior. When you find that hymn, you will see that it's a very short praise chorus, and so we will sing it through twice. Number 286, please stand with us as we sing.
So he does. Thank you. Please be seated and the children can come forward. Good to see our little friends. We are glad that you're here. Now, I want you to think about a mosquito bite. Have you ever had a mosquito bite anywhere? I bet everybody here has had lots of them in your lifetime. Okay, hands down. <laughs> I've had a lot of mosquito bites too. Now, let's pretend that Jonathan has a mosquito bite right here on his arm. Okay? Now, this thing is itching. And his mom and dad keep telling him, don't scratch that, it will make it worse. It's going to keep itching and you might make it bleed, so don't scratch that mosquito bite. So what can Jonathan do to keep from scratching that mosquito bite? Well, one thing he might do is put on some big, old, heavy winter gloves. Here you go, Jonathan, can you put that on? You couldn't use that hand anyway because it's on that arm, but let's put this one on the left hand. There you go. Now... That might keep him from really scratching it because of these thick winter gloves. And so pretend you're scratching your mosquito bite with that hand, Jonathan. Yeah, you might rub it, but you can't really scratch it. Okay, you can stop rubbing. All right, there you go. Well, even if he had the gloves on, he would know that mosquito bite is still there and it would still be itching. All right, so let's think of trying something else. Let's say we put a Band-Aid on his arm where that mosquito bite is. So, Jonathan, if you will allow me, I'm going to put this Band-Aid right there where your imaginary mosquito bite is. You've got a souvenir from church. How about that? Okay. <laughs> there you go. All right. So, the Band-Aid would cover up the mosquito bite, but he would know that it's still there under the Band-Aid, and he would know that it's still itching. So, that wouldn't be the best solution either. But I've got something that would help him to not think so much about the mosquito bite and how much it is itching. And it's candy. Yes. <laughs> now, this is a kind of candy that I really like. And uh, with your parents' permission, I'm going to give you each one of you one of these before you go back to your seat. But I like these myself. And this is delicious chocolate and coconut candy. And uh, do you like it, Jonathan? There you go. I knew you would. You like just about any food, don't you? Yeah, okay. <laughs> but if Jonathan ate this delicious candy, even though the mosquito bite is still there on his arm, he might not think about it so much. It wouldn't bother him nearly as much when this delicious candy is in his mouth and he is swallowing it and enjoying it to the fullest. Now, I say all of that because we all have problems in life. Uh, maybe you have a little mosquito bite, maybe something bigger or worse. Maybe you catch a cold or you feel sick some other way. Or maybe somebody in your family is in the hospital and you're really worried and concerned about them. So we can all have a lot of problems. Well, just like Jonathan and his imaginary mosquito bite, there are things that can take our minds off our problems so they don't seem quite as big. And especially... For those of us who know God, you can think about all the good things that God does for you every day that you live. That will help take your mind off your problems and your troubles. You can think about how much Jesus loves you. He came to be your Savior and your friend. And so when you start thinking about that, these other things that are problems might not seem so big after all. And that's how much God loves us. That's how wonderful he is. So... The delicious candy would probably take Jonathan's mind off his mosquito bite, at least for a while. But God's love for us really does change things and get our minds on him and not our problems. And so, I'm going to give each one of you a piece of candy. Please don't open it now. Wait till you get back to your seat and you let your parents or grandparents tell you when and whether you can have it, okay? <laughs> I don't want to get into trouble with them. Here you go. Yes, you can have one. It's all right, isn't it, Dad? Okay, here you go. There you go. All right. There you are. <laughs> Hi, Mary Grace. <laughs> okay. So let's thank God that he helps us. When we have troubles and problems, we need to keep our minds and our attention on him. Let's get real still, 
You close your eyes and we'll pray together. Heavenly Father, we know that times of trouble come to all of us. We all have problems. But I pray that you will help us to think more about all of your goodness and how much Jesus loves us so that we won't just focus on our problems. Thank you for every way that you show your love for us. Please bless these precious children in every way. For it's in Jesus' name that we ask it through faith. Amen. Thank you. Let us pray together. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come this morning, God, to give you thanks, God, for another day, Lord. Amen. We thank you, Lord, for the honor of being in your house today, God, to come as Christians together together, Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for Stephen Green Baptist Church, God. Amen. For each person that's gathered here today, Lord. And dear Heavenly Father, let's remember the ones that are not able to attend, God, for physical reasons. Dear Heavenly Father, be with them, Lord. We lift them up to you. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask a special prayer, to, Lord, for the ones that are lost, God. Not only in this community, Lord, in this state, but throughout the world, God. Let them learn of your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord. Let them accept him as their personal Savior, God. Because through him, they too can have eternal life, Lord. Amen. I be with them, God. We lift them up to you. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you be with Mickey this morning, God, that you would fill him with the words that you would have us here, Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, as Christians, God, we can't be Christians just on Sunday, Lord. We need to be Christians seven days a week, 365 days a year, God. Let us remember that as we go out into another day, Lord. Just be with us and guide us, Lord. Forgive us of our sins, God. We've all fallen short, Lord. But we know through your Son, Jesus Christ, that we can be forgiven, God. Amen. If we confess our sins with our mouth, he will forgive us, Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you be with us at this time, Lord. That you would take these gifts, that you would multiply them. Bless the gift and bless the giver. For all these things we ask in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior's name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
hope that you have personally experienced God's amazing grace in your life. As we open God's word together, I call your attention to some verses in the 14th chapter of the book of Joshua, and I'll begin reading with verse 6. Today we're continuing our series of messages on little known people in the Bible who have some big time stories and a lot to teach us. We come to another of those characters in these verses. Then the sons of Judah drew near to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite said to him, You know the word which the Lord spoke to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, a servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought word back to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt with fear. But I followed the Lord my God fully. So Moses swore on that day, saying, <clears throat> Surely the land on which your foot has trodden will be an inheritance to you and to your children forever, because you have followed the Lord my God fully. Now behold, the Lord has let me live, just as he spoke these 45 years from the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses when Israel walked in the wilderness. And now behold, I am 85 years old today. I am still as strong today as I was in the day of Moses sent me. As my strength was then, so my strength is now for war and for going out and coming in. Now then, Give me this hill country about which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day that Anakim were there with great fortified cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me. And I will drive them out as the Lord has spoken. So Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb the son of Jephunneh for an inheritance. Therefore Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite until this day because he followed the Lord God of Israel fully. I want you to think with me about some famous spies from history, first of all. A hundred years ago, in Paris, France, there was an exotic dancer and prostitute named Mata Hari. And she began spying for Germany during World War I. She used sex to get information from high-ranking military leaders and politicians. But eventually, Mata Hari was arrested in a Paris hotel room, and she was executed by a firing squad. And then here in the United States, there was a married couple, the Rosenbergs, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, who were American communists. And they started spying for the Soviet Union here in 1942, after World War II had begun. And for several years, the Rosenbergs passed American nuclear secrets to the Soviet military. But both of them were arrested and executed in 1953. Now I mention those spies because <clears throat> the one thing that people who know anything about Caleb remember is that he was a spy. And so here is the background to the verses of scripture that I read in Joshua chapter 14. You have to go back to a previous book here in the Old Testament, the book of Numbers. And there you see this dramatic story in Numbers chapter 13 and 14, when the children of Israel, having recently left slavery down in Egypt, have arrived at the southern border of the promised land of, Israel, of Canaan. God had promised this land to their ancestor Abraham and to all of them as descendants. And they were there on the threshold of the promised land. They could look across the valley and see it. But while they were camped there, before they entered the land as a people, Moses sent 12 spies in, one from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. So Moses sent them in to spy out the promised land. After 40 days, those 12 spies returned to the camp. Ten of them gave a pessimistic and discouraging report. In fact, here is something of what they said. Here's a portion of the majority report, those ten spies. They said to Moses and to all their people, We went in the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey. 
That was a way of expressing it was a good place to be desired. It flows with milk and honey. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. We are not able to go up against the people, for they are too strong for us. They are all men of great size, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. So this is a report that 10 of those 12 spies gave to their people. Frankly, their names are forgotten. Nobody remembers those 10 men. But among that group of 12 spies who went, there were two heroes of faith. Joshua and Caleb, who is the focus of this message today. They saw everything in the land that those 10 spies had seen. But their hearts were different. They came back and they encouraged the people to go up and take the land as God had already commanded them to do. In fact, listen to some of Caleb's words. Way back there, 45 years before what we're reading here in Joshua 14, when he and Joshua came back from the promised land, here is a part of Caleb's report to the people. After hearing the pessimistic report from the ten spies, he said, we should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we shall surely overcome it. If the Lord is pleased with us, then He will bring us into this land and give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land. The Lord is with us, do not fear them. That was Joshua and Caleb's attitude. Those were Caleb's words. And so here are the people, they've got these two very different reports. What do they do? Whom do they believe and follow? Well, you probably know the sad rest of that story. The people listened mostly to the majority report, the discouraging report of those ten spies. The people became cowardly after hearing they, those, their words. They decided they could not go into the promised land and therefore they would not. Do you know what the result of that fateful decision was? It goes beyond words. Since the people rebelled against God, the Lord said they would wander out there in the desert for the next 40 years until the older generation died out. You don't believe me? You don't believe I can do what I have promised you? You don't believe I have already given this land to you? You just need to go in and take it? If you don't believe that, then you will not enter it, God said. And so his judgment was that everybody there that day who listened to the report of the ten spies, everybody over the age of 20 would die over the next 40 years, wandering around out there with everyone in the desert. Caleb and Joshua were the only two exceptions. They were the only really old people who finally went into the promised land. And as Caleb reminds us here, he was 40 years old when he and the other spies were sent into the land. But now we come to the words of our text in Joshua chapter 14. This is 45 years later. Caleb is 85. He's got a lot to reflect upon, but he's already looking ahead. The people have entered the promised land about five years before. They have crossed over the Jordan River. They've had the experience at the walled city of Jericho. And you remember that dramatic story, the walls coming down. They have conquered people in the land, and now the land is being divided up among the tribes of Israel. Now, there was no tribe of Caleb. He was of the tribe of Judah. But Moses had promised him 45 years earlier that he would have an inheritance in the promised land. And that brings us to Caleb's request in the verses that I read. Give me this certain territory, he said to Joshua. Now, I want us to look at this man, Caleb, and see what he teaches us because I believe this man challenges all of us in different ways first of all Caleb challenges all of us to be committed now in the verses that I read earlier at the beginning of this message there is a phrase that is repeated in fact it is a phrase that is found three times in the verses that I read and it is Caleb followed the Lord God fully now you think about those words in that description. What a wonderful description for anyone, then or now. What a wonderful testimony. What a wonderful epitaph if somebody would put that on your tombstone. He or she followed the Lord God fully. Well, 
That's exactly what Moses and even the Lord said about Caleb. And so I believe that it means every ounce, every nerve, every fiber of Caleb's being belonged to God. He wasn't perfect. No human being is. But he belonged to God fully and served him. I also like this description of Caleb back in the book of Numbers again in chapter 14. It describes him as having a different spirit. There was something special about this man. 45 years before the events we're reading about. He had a different spirit than most people around him. He wanted to please God above all else. That was most important to him. And that should challenge us. It should remind us that we should not be too concerned about what everybody else thinks. We're human and so their ideas, their thoughts about us, their opinions of us, their words about us, they do matter. We understand that. We're human. But Caleb says, don't worry too much about what other people think about you. You be most concerned about what God thinks of you. And through no fault of his own, Caleb was also forced to wander out there in the desert for 40 years. Think about it. He had been faithful to God back there at that fateful juncture of time at Kadesh Barnea when he returned with the other spies. But he was still a part of the people, the congregation. And so he too was forced to wander around in the desert. He suffered because of the disobedience of other people. That happens to us too sometimes, does it? And yet, for all of that, Caleb never blamed God. He just simply kept trusting Him. He teaches us that in the year 2016, half-hearted Christians never accomplish much. And so it is. Think about commitment with me. The story goes that a chicken and a hog were walking down the street one day and they passed a church building. And on the sign out front, was the title of the next Sunday's sermon. The title was Helping the Poor. So they kept walking along and finally the chicken said, well, Brother Hogg, I have an idea. He said, I know how we can help the poor. Why don't you and I provide all those poor people a nice breakfast of ham and eggs? <laughs> the hog thought for a moment. He said, well, ham and eggs. He said, that's easy for you to say. Because for you, that would be just a contribution. But for me, he said, that's total commitment. <laughs> and so it is. How committed are we? Caleb was committed to the Lord. And then I read this true story about a foreign missionary. And he was baptizing a certain new convert in a river. There was no baptistry pool such as we have today. And so they were out there in the river. And the water was flowing rather swiftly. True story. And so the missionary took a long spear out into the water with him for the baptism. He was going to plunge it down into the bed of the river to brace himself against the strong current of the water so that he wouldn't stumble or fall. So he took the spear out. The baptismal candidate went with him out into the middle of the river. The missionary had to plunge the spear twice to get it to a secure spot in the bed of the river. He had no way of knowing that he accidentally, on the first plunge of that spear, had stabbed the foot of the man he was about to baptize. He really did. And the strange thing is, the baptismal candidate never flinched. He didn't say a word. He didn't try to move. And the missionary never realized what he had done. But after the baptism was over and the accident was discovered, somebody asked the candidate, well, why were you silent? Why didn't you say something? This is what he actually said. He said, well, I thought that was part of the ceremony. It is kind of humorous on one level, but when you think about it, he was right. Because Christian baptism, as we understand it, practice it, should be an outward expression of our willingness to suffer for Christ, if necessary, after all, we're being baptized in his name. Commitment. And then I read about a man in Nigeria. He's a Christian, but his body is badly deformed. 
His legs are twisted and useless. And so this man is unable to walk at all. And he can't afford to pay for transportation. And so this man crawls to the worship services of his church every time they meet. And it's quite a long distance. And in order for him to bring his Bible, he either balances it on his head or he pushes it on the ground in front of him. Think about that. There is a man who knows the value of commitment to the Lord. When his church family meets, that man is there. What a challenge and an inspiration to us. Caleb teaches us to be committed, but he also challenges us to be confident. Think about this. At the time of the verses that I read at the beginning, here's Caleb now, an 85-year-old man. And when you understand everything that he said in those verses, even at this advanced age, he believed that he could be a giant killer. That's what he says. If you look again at verse 12, you will see he refers to a group of people who live in a certain part of the promised land, the Anakim. Do you know who the Anakim were? They were a tribe of giants. They were really taller than other people. And a few years earlier, most of them had been destroyed when the Israelites, Caleb's people, occupied the land. But a few of them remained. By the way, their descendants later would include some Philistines, even a man named Goliath. He was a descendant of some of these same people who were in the promised land when Caleb is speaking in our text. And so... He said, that's the part of territory that I want. That area around Hebron, where the Anakim still are. Give that land to me, Joshua, he said. I'm ready to go up and face those giants again. I believe the Lord and I can take them, he said. He's confident. He's confident. Listen to these words from the book book of Deuteronomy after going back to the time when the Israelites believed that discouraging report of the ten spies the Lord said not one of these men this evil generation shall see the good land which I swore to give to your fathers except Caleb he shall see it and to him and to his sons I will give the land on which he has set foot because he has followed the Lord fully those were God's words 45 years earlier again did you notice the phrase God said because Caleb followed the Lord fully. There it is again. So that was God's promise to him 45 years before our text. And yet here at age of 85, he still has the same faith in God that he did at age 40. Caleb understood that faith is more than just positive thinking. More than just pretending your problems don't exist. No, he understood that taking God at his word and acting upon it, that's what faith is. And so it always is. Believing that God will do what He says. How about you? Dr. John Bisogno has served as pastor of First Baptist Church in Houston, Texas for many years. And one day, he was in his study or office at his home. And he was busy reading, as pastors often are. And his little six-year-old daughter walked up and said, Daddy, will you build me a playhouse? John was so absorbed in what he was reading, he really didn't pay much attention. And he just, without looking up, said, okay, honey. And then he went on reading. Twenty minutes later, he looked out the window into the backyard. And there he saw his little girl piling up toys, and dolls, and tea sets. And John asked his wife, what is she doing? His wife said, well, you told her you would build a playhouse for her, so she's getting ready for it. John Bazzano said later, when he heard that and he saw his little girl out there making those preparations, he said, I quickly dropped what I was reading and I rushed to the nearest building supply store to get materials to build that little girl a playhouse because she believed that her father would do what he said he would do. How about us? Do we really believe the promises of God? Do we take them seriously? Do we act upon them? Do we live them? The Bible is filled with precious promises that God makes to His people. He will keep 
All of them. He will never leave you. He will protect you. He will guide you. He will offer you forgiveness when you confess. He will remove that burden of guilt from your life. You don't have to go on carrying that load and living under that burden. He will give you meaning and purpose. He will take you to heaven if you put your faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. Do you believe that God will do what He says? Caleb did. He challenges us to be committed and confident. But then, lastly, he challenges us to be courageous. He reflects back to when he was 40 years old. And he told the people, Yes, there are obstacles there. Yes, there are some frightening people there. But we can take this land, he said. Don't listen to these ten guys who don't have faith. Let's listen to our God. That was 45 years earlier. Now here in these verses, he still has the courage to go up against giants. As an old man, he's still ready to face whatever obstacles and dangers are there when God is with him. By the way, the name Caleb literally means dog. That's what his name means. And I like that in the best sense of the word because I like to think about Caleb as God's bulldog. That's who he was. Even at the age of 85, he is still bold and courageous and vigorous and faithful. No matter what. He drove out those giants from his inheritance late, late in life. No rocking chair for Caleb. He's still on the front lines for God. Man of courage. Courage takes many forms. Ray Blankenship lives in Andover, Ohio. One morning, as he was fixing his breakfast, he looked out his kitchen window, and he saw a little girl being swept along in the rain-flooded drainage ditch that ran near his house. Ray knew that farther downstream, the ditch disappeared under a road, and then it emptied into the main culvert, where there was no hope of rescue after that. And so, realizing all of that, seeing the girl's predicament, Ray dropped what he was doing, he ran out the door, raced along the ditch, trying to get ahead of the little girl being swept along in the current, trying to get to that helpless child. When he finally did, when he finally caught up to her, he jumped into the deep churning water. Ray went under, then he surfaced, and he was able to grab the little girl's arm. They tumbled together, end over end, in the water. And when they were only three feet from that huge culvert, somehow Ray's free hand felt a rock on the bank of the ditch and he held on to it desperately. But the tremendous force of that water was threatening every second to tear him and the little girl apart and wash them away. And Ray thought to himself, if I can just hang on for a little while until help comes. But he did better than that. By the time the rescuers arrived, he had pulled the little girl to safety. Both of them were treated for shock, but otherwise they were fine. Soon after their ordeal, Ray was awarded the Coast Guard's Silver Life-Saving Medal, and rightly so. That award was fitting for Ray Blankenship because the rescuer was even at a greater risk to himself than most people knew. Ray Blankenship can't swim. That's courage. That's courage. Where do you get your courage to face all the difficulties of life, to deal with the frightening times that bring a chill to your heart. Where do you turn for courage? From what do you draw for your personal strength and courage? Caleb says you can get your courage from God. He lived it. He lived it for decades. And the Bible says that God does not give us a spirit of fear. No, He is there. To help us at all times. I close with this story. At the Summer Olympic Games in Barcelona, Spain in 1992, there was a British runner named Derek Redmond. And Derek participated in the 400 meter race one day. And so all the competitors are at the starting line. The starting gun is fired, 
and they all leap forward. 400 meter race. But just after he started, Derek Redmond pulled a hamstring and fell right on the ground. Everyone thought that he was finished. But slowly, Derek stood up and he began to hobble around the track. He was determined that he was going to finish the race. So he started hobbling. But it was obvious there was no way he could finish. He staggered and he started to fall again. When a man came running out of the stands, a spectator, came onto the track, put his arm around Derek and helped him the rest of the way around that track, all the way across the finish line. Everybody in the stadium stood and cheered because he had finished the race. That was a very moving scene, of course, very touching. But it was even more so when you realize that the man who came alongside him to help was Derek's own father. Listen. When we face life's giants, and when we're in danger of falling, the Heavenly Father comes alongside us to help us carry on for His glory and finish our race with Him. What a wonderful, wonderful Lord. Let us pray together. Father, we can point to many examples in the Bible and elsewhere of men and women who have shown their great faith in you. They challenge us. They inspire us. Thank you for a man like Caleb. Thank you for his courage, his commitment. Thank you, Father, for all that you did through him. And I pray that you will help us to search our hearts. That we too will determine that what your will is for us is most important. Not our own plans, our own desires or wishes. But may it be said of us that we too, though human, though frail, though sinful, that we too followed the Lord fully. And now as we come to these moments of decision and response, Father, lead us by your Spirit. Help each of us to give Jesus Christ first place in our lives. You lead us as we wait before you now. We ask in his precious name. Amen. Our hymn of commitment is number 474. If God is speaking to you about any decision, this is your time. If you need to come for prayer for yourself or someone else, this is your time as well, and this is God's time. He's waiting for you. Let's sing prayerfully. Hymn number 474. Stand with us, please. Thank you for joining us for this time of worship. And again, I hope it was helpful to you. I hope that God was able to teach you along with all of us from His Holy Word. And we would like to invite you to join us again. Tune in by local television or on the internet, whichever way that you're watching and sharing these services with us. We hope you will tune in at your convenience uh, for future worship times as well. And if you live here in or near Winsboro, then we would invite you to come and worship with us if you're looking for a church home. I know that our folks would help you to feel at home and uh, this is a place where the Bible is preached and everyone is welcome. So until we meet again in worship, my prayer is that God will bless you richly and you will make sure of your faith in Jesus Christ. <laughs>